Hello and welcome to Oworm. Today we'll be taking a look at the anatomy of a dogfish shark. This is Spot. He's a dogfish shark. Now, you might be a bit confused, given that dogfish shark just sounds like someone crammed three wildly different animals into one name. This is because the dogfish shark works like the chimera from Greek mythology and has the head of a dog, a body of a fish, and the tail of a shark, as you can clearly see here. If you want a less interesting but more accurate reason for why a dogfish shark is named like that, we surprisingly don't have scientists to blame for this one. Turns out fishermen are just as bad as naming things, and when they saw a bunch of sharks chasing down fish in dog-like packs, they said, well, there's three animals in that sentence. We got ourselves a first, middle, and last name there. Sharks are part of a group called cartilaginous fish, which is only the lamest name for a club ever, according to the Association of Bony Fish. This means that the shark's skeleton is made almost entirely of cartilage, not bone. So the next time you see a shark, don't run. Stand your ground and tell them to grow a spine. Okay, so now let's take a look at the external anatomy. Sharks have actually changed very little over the past 100 million years. They got the apex predator thing nailed down pretty quick, apparently. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We monkeys still have a lot of trial and error to go through. Some perks of being a shark include a streamlined body, which helps it swim very fast to catch prey by reducing friction. This is the same logic that people use when they make sports cars that look like they got squeezed out of a crushed toilet paper tube. They've also got powerful muscles along the tail to win those swimming contests. They always win because they eat the rest of the competition. But the point here is that they can swim fast enough to eat the competition. I'm not judging. They're making use of the tools at their disposal. Won't be winning any sportsmanship prizes anytime soon though. Now, when I flip the shark over, you can also see this jaw, which is lined with rows of teeth for the crunch. The earliest jaws actually appear in sharks about 430 million years ago. That's right, sharks invented jaws. Honestly, Steven Spielberg should have paid that shark some royalty fees. But all these things are useless if you can't find your prey. That's why sharks also come equipped with a whole array of sensory organs. For example, here are the eyes. Sharks also have a keen sense of smell, and their nostrils are down here, which you can see if I flip it over. Now if you're thinking, well I have those too, they're not special, a shark will come and find you with their ampullae of Lorenzini. These special structures beneath the skin can detect electrical signals, so they can find their prey even if it's impossible to see or smell it. Sharks also have lateral line sensors along the side, which you can see here. And this is like a cool tool belt that can detect changes in water pressure. And here are the gill slits, which are the openings for the gills. Now let's take a look at the fins. The fins up here next to the shoulder are called the pectoral fins which help the shark steer left and right. Further down are the pelvic fins here, which help the shark do a barrel roll in the water. Just kidding, I wish. Pelvic fins actually do the opposite by stabilizing the shark and keeping it from rolling over. What a downer, barrel rolls are cool. Pelvic fins can also tell you if the shark is male or female, because in males, they're modified to have long, stiffer structures called claspers. So here you can see our shark is male. Now if I turn it over, up here is the classic shark fin, the dorsal fin. This is the fin you see poking out of the water in movies. Dorsal fins help keep the shark from tipping over like that. There's a smaller one down here as well. At the end is the tail, which is the main powerhouse of the shark. The tail moves side to side to propel the shark's entire body forwards. I say forwards because sharks are basically incapable of moving backwards. Imagine a shark trying to parallel park. Must be a nightmare. Now if I turn it over again, here you can see an opening. And this opening is called the cloaca. This is the exit for both the digestive and urogenital systems in the shark. Shark 
Shark skin feels like sandpaper because they're covered with a bunch of little tooth-like structures that act like armor. But I think the most important takeaway here is that now we know that a bunch of tiny little teeth bunched together feels like sandpaper. Imagine if sandpaper really was made with tiny little teeth. How do you know it's not? Has anyone bothered to check? Here I'm moving with the grain of the tooth-like structures so you won't hear anything. But when I go against the grain like this, you can hear a rasp. I'll include the original audio so you can hear it. Now we'll dive into the internal anatomy. I'm putting the sharp belly up and I'm cutting into the body cavity, which is also called the coelom. I'm using the scissors to cut through the muscular body wall. So I'm going to cut until I reach just under the gills and just below the pelvic fin. And just cut out a little window on both sides. So this shark is double injected, which means that the arteries are injected with red, like you can see here, and the hepatic tissue or the liver tissue was injected with yellow, like you can see here. Okay, now one thing you should know about sharks is that they forgot a really important thing when they came into existence because they don't have a swim bladder. Now just because you live somewhere where you can float all the time doesn't mean gravity still can't be a problem. Because it can and it will. Unlike fish, who's got it made with a swim bladder that helps keep them buoyant, sharks need to work around the clock or else they'll sink to the bottom of the sea. For sharks, it's literally sink or swim. One of the ways they compensate for this is by having a really oily body. You can see here that it's really oily on my gloves. Because oil is less dense than water, this helps them float a bit more. A lot of this oil is also concentrated and stored in this liver right here. The liver, like in many other vertebrates, is the largest organ in the shark's body. And it has three lobes, so you can see one lobe here, another lobe here, and it's a bit broken. But here you go. So that's the broken part. And there's a third lobe that's hard to see, but it's in the middle. So I see three lobes, but the middle lobe is a lot smaller than these two enormous lobes on the side. It's just like any other group project. Now I'm actually going to do a cool little experiment. I'm going to cut off a piece of the liver here and drop it into water. So when I drop it in, you can see that it floats. The liver actually has so much oil in it that it floats in water. So now I'm going to remove the liver so you can get a better look at the other structures. So now that the liver is gone, you can see this structure here. This structure is the stomach of the shark. You can see that it goes down like this and then it bends like a hook before it enters the intestine. It's pretty large and it can also expand further to hold larger prey. Because most sharks swallow their food whole or bite it into relatively large pieces, their stomachs use very strong acids and enzymes to dissolve most of what is eaten. Only liquid mush can enter the intestines because the pyloric valve, which is here, and connects the stomach and the intestines, is small. Large bones and other indigestible objects are prevented from going past this pyloric valve and are instead vomited out. So this entire thing is the stomach here. It's very large. Um, the top more muscular part here is called the cardiac stomach and this lower part is called the pyloric stomach. Now here is the shark's intestine. You can see it has this striped pattern, and this is because there's a spiral inside the intestine. To see how this works, imagine jumping to the ground from a 10 feet drop. Not very fun. But now imagine riding a spiral tube slide from 10 feet high. Very fun. This is because the spiral slows you down and prevents you from breaking your bones. In the same way, the spiral in the intestine slows down the food and gives it more time and surface area for absorption. We might cut this open later to get a better look at the spiral. Now lying beneath the pyloric valve is the pancreas. 
might be a bit hard to see, but it's right there. Right there. There's also another lobe around here if I can find it. Yep, right here. So the pancreas produces digestive enzymes and hormones. Now here, the structure at the end of the stomach is the spleen. It's a bit damaged, but you can see there's a darker part here. The spleen is the main part of the shark's immune system. You also have this film-like structure, which is the mesentery tissue, and this keeps everything anchored where it should be. Now down here at the base of the tail is this structure here, which is called the rectal gland. Because sharks live in the ocean, they're constantly taking in salt water. This gland helps balance the shark's salt level by excreting high amounts of concentrated salt. So now I'm going to cut into the stomach. I'm hoping that we can see some of the food that the shark ate. We'll see. So there we go. There you go. Oh my god, you can see a little you can see a little shrimp here. Look at this. So the shark ate a little shrimp. That's cute. So now I'll cut a little bit further up into the esophagus, which is the pink part here. So here is the esophagus, and you can see it's lined with these little bumps. These are called papillae, and they form a tight seal to keep water out of the digestive tract. Here in the stomach, you see these folds, which are called rugi. This increases the surface area of the stomach, and also helps the stomach expand, like an accordion. So now I'm going to cut into the intestine. So here you can see the spiral walls. You can see the walls of the spiral here, right here. And there's another one on the other side. And it keeps going down because it's a spiral. So there's another one here. Now we're done with the digestive tract, so I'll remove it. So here we can see these structures, which are the gonads. In this case, we have a male, so these are the testes. I'm going to remove these as well. Now, the kidneys look a bit unexpected in the shark. Running along the spine here, you can see this pink stripe. This is the blood vessel. The kidneys are actually these raised structures running along next to those blood vessels. This part at the bottom here is actually the seminal vesicle. The sperm from the testes travels down along the kidneys, like this, to reach the seminal vesicle. Now I'm going to cut into the upper part of the body. You'll have to crunch through some cartilage while you do this, so just crunch along.
So before I show you the heart and gills, I just figured out something really cool. So here you see the esophagus, which you cut before when you cut off the digestive tract. If I put my probe in here, it comes out straight through the jaw. That's interesting, isn't it? Okay, anyway, let's get back to the heart. So you can see these gills and the heart in the center. Now as you saw before, here are the gill slits. And on this side, they're still intact, but on this side, I cut it open. So you can see that each gill slit leads to one row of gills. Like this. You can also see that the gills have these little filaments to increase surface area. So these gills are what the sharks use to breathe, taking in oxygen and expelling carbon dioxide. So down in the center is the heart. Sharks, like most fish, have a two-chambered heart. So it has one atrium and one ventricle. So you can see this structure here is the ventricle. And it looks like there's two atria, but it's actually two lobes of one atrium. It actually connects in the back. So the problem with this is that once the ventricle pumps blood to the gills, the blood slows down significantly in the gills here, and it still needs to make its way through the body and back to the heart. Later vertebrates, like us, circumvented this by having a four-chambered heart, where the blood from the lungs returns to the heart for an extra pump before going into the body tissues. Here in the shark heart though, you can see some other structures that are the precursors to the other two chambers of the heart that we have. So for example, when I lift the ventricle up here, here is the sinus venosus below the ventricle. It's this triangular structure here. And the blood enters this before going into the atrium. And after the atrium, it goes into the ventricle. And here is the conus arteriosus, which the blood enters after leaving the ventricle. Hi, that's the end of our dogfish shark dissection. Thanks for staying, lads. Here's a fun fact about dogfish sharks to send you on your way. Due in part to their small size, dogfish sharks are one of the easiest shark species to keep in captivity and therefore are frequently used in laboratory studies. Interestingly, this means that there are more scientific papers published on this species than any other shark. Weird flex photo case, okay, spot.